just one minute. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm happy to uh, welcome uh, uh, Robert Webster. In fact, he may not know why I invited him, but I, I, I tell him now. Is that because I'm looking at all the people who are most more cycled than I am, just to show you the one who have been cited better than me. Even if they, I don't know them, I know that they are very good. So I want that my institution is able to make that you meet the big people in the field. So he's one of the three guys most cited than me in microbiology, which is a shame. <laughs> so I want him to come and explain why he's so good. That's the next best time I invited the the only guy cited more than me in France that hurt me and I understood at the end why it was so good. But in this case he's working with flu and I will ask Henry to introduce his work before I give him a, a way to explain that why he is doing so well. Okay, so it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Robert Webster has been working at the uh, uh, St. John Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, everything can be done on influenza, he has done it, basically. Influenza A, B, C, now influenza D. Uh, and as we discussed today, he's also facing the problem, the ethical problem that we are facing in science now and facing the problem of gain of function, may explain you what is gain of function. Uh, uh, but if you uh, need a reference to gold standard for influenza, you have it today in front of you. So, first of all, to that. Thank you, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to put the microphone down and see if you can hear me. I have a very big voice anyway, so can you hear me in the back? Yes. No one says no, so I think it's okay. So why am I cited so often in the literature? Uh, it is because I, I have a willingness to travel the world, and I have a slob, and I put it up the butt of ducks. <laughs> ducks are all over the world. And when we discover that influenza uh, the, is not really a problem of humans so much, but of the ducks of the world. And this uh, side panel here is a, a piece of art in my home uh, depicting the natural history of influenza. Uh, and the, the uh, central feature is, is the mallard duck, and it transfers through the pig to humans and it's a global problem. The red is the high fever, the segmented genome of mixing and, and creating new viruses. So that's the total of, of my seminar. And so uh, today I will speak mainly about the group of viruses H9N2, but my work covers the whole field of influenza. So at the end, if you wish to ask questions about any aspect, the first uh, real threat that is in the world today is, is uh, Ebola. And, and as a, someone stu studying emerging <coughs> diseases, this is an example of how we have failed the world, essentially. And, and it tells us that we are really not prepared. But fortunately, uh, we, this is now coming under control. But we should all be ashamed of ourselves with 20,000 death uh, cases and more than nearly 8,000 deaths and probably many, many more than that. The second major threat is uh, the uh, MERS COV, which was first reported in Saudi in 2012, uh, coming from camels, probably again from bats and causing severe acute respiratory illness. And this is still ticking on uh, in coming out of Saudi Arabia into camels. 
And the third area, I believe, is influenza. It is a threat that is currently not realized. So looking historically at influenza, the, there were only three subtypes of influenza, H1, 2, and 3, the past century. Historically, H2N2 and H3N2 were probably in humans. Then we had the Spanish influenza, followed by the Asian, and the H2N2 only spent about 10 years, so we have to watch this one because it will probably come again. H1N1 is rather unique in that it has come again and again back into humans. And I won't have time to deal with it, but there is a real problem with that. Currently in the United States, influenza is a serious problem. The uh, H3N2 component of the vaccine does not match, and so we have severe influenza. The number of cases this year is already twice previous years. The number of dead children already is two or three times that of other years, and 43 of the states are already affected. Uh, and, and so this is a continuing problem. And just to introduce the whole panel of influenza, there are 16 subtypes in the aquatic birds of the world, two new ones in bats. I don't know if they're really influenza. I have some doubts about that. But note, of those 16 subtypes, only three have really successfully adapted to humans. And some of my colleagues say that, you know, only H1, 2, and 3 have the capacity to be a problem in humans. But we can't trust that. We have to be prepared. Because historically, I believe that H7 was in humans many, many years ago. And so the, the black figures, H5, 6, 7, and 9, are those ones that are trying it on, if you like, trying to spread to humans. And almost always they come through pigs, or pigs are involved in this transmission. Two that we have to keep in mind always are H5 and H7. These occur in the wild birds of the world. All 16 subtypes occur in the wild birds. In the wild birds, uh, H5 and H7 cause no disease signs. They replicate predominantly in the intestinal tract, and they're only a problem after they get into the poultry farms of the world, into gallinaceous poultry where they acquire a series of basic amino acids from the cleavage site of the hemagglutinin, along with many other changes, and cause this hemorrhagic disease and up to 100% mortality. <coughs> Looking back at the ecology, some of the principles that uh, we established after going around the world and poking swabs up the butts of birds, is that uh, these viruses replicate predominantly in the intestinal tract and are spread fetal oral through the water. And they cause no apparent disease. The, the birds uh, appear absolutely normal. Um, some people tell me that there are some costs and that the birds don't fly so far, but they're inapparent. And when we look at the influenza viruses of the world, they are divided into two major clades, the America's clade and, and the clade in Eurasia. And maybe there are others that are showing up in Australia and South America, but we don't know too much about those. And so the continuing challenges that we have with influenza is the variant H3M2, this is a virus that is in pigs in the United States. 
and when children go to the country fairs and <coughs> visit the pig barns and the little children rub noses with the pig, we get transfers from the pig to the human. There's 343 cases so far uh, with one death. In, in Mexico, we have this H7N3 highly pathogenic virus in chickens, and that's a, a total disaster. The Mexicans should have stamped it out, and it appeared on one farm, they didn't, too much corruption, and now it's spread everywhere. It doesn't spread too often to humans, except through conjunctivitis, much more than they let us know. H5N1, um, we'll talk a little more about. It's in Asia and the Middle East. It has not spread to the Americas. The low path H9N2 is in Eurasia, and that's the one I'm going to spend most time on. And more recently, we have H7N9 in China, and more recently still, the new H5N1, uh, which is rapidly spreading around and just is showing up in wild birds in the Americas. And the, the, the spread of these viruses, H5N1 appeared in Asia in 1997, uh, and spread throughout most of Eurasia. 63 countries were affected. It's been contained in most of them. It did not get to the Americas, so I don't believe that it spread significantly through wild birds. The H7N9 appeared in 2013, and so far is confined to China. 470 cases, 182 deaths. The H9N2 appeared in the early 70s. Um, been 17 cases in humans, and this is the one I'm going to spend most of the time on. But let's go back historically to H5. Before 1996, there were no cases reported in humans in the world. After 97, there have been over 600, nearly 700 cases. What happens? H9N2 inserted its genome into the inside of H5N1. The same thing happened in 2013. Uh, H7, there were sporadic human cases before 2013. Now, the ongoing problem again. H9N2 inserted its genome into the H7N9 virus. I call the H9N2 the enablers. The enablers, whether they're enabling these viruses to do these nasty things. Uh, these viruses first appeared in Asia in the early 1990s first detected in China in 1994. They cause mild and inapparent disease in domestic poultry. You take these viruses into the lab, put them into chickens, they do nothing. You put them in the field and in conjunction with other respiratory and other viral diseases, they're a disaster. Uh, and they become endemic in poultry a century through the whole of Eurasia, and they occasionally transmit to humans and swine, and they've, been, they've evolved, they continue to evolve, and these viruses just love to mate, they mate with almost anything they find, and they're the providers of the genes that do the uh, provide to H5N1, H7N9, H10N8, and probably a lot of others in China. So these H9N2, they appeared in China and spread practically over this region of the world. They, and they developed into a plethora of different clades and subclades. We have H9N2 in the Americas, and we occasionally isolate them from ducks and uh, shorebirds, but they're a totally different genome from the Asia one. And so we, we've been trying to work out the, 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 what 
happened with the genesis of the H7N9 virus? And what were the, was the build-up to the insertion of the H9N2 genome into the H9N7 backbone? And uh, this, as I've already said, the H9N2 spread widely in chickens across China uh, and caused economic loss. First egg, drop in egg production, then co infections and serious economic loss in poultry farms. And in 1998, the Chinese introduced an inactivated oil immersion, uh, inactivated vaccine, and they started using it in chickens. And 2007, by 2007, the vaccines were essentially useless, and we'll come to what happened with that. And so we want to characterize these viruses. And so, my, this, this work was done by a postdoc in my lab over the, the past year, a visitor from China, and she studied uh, 1,975 uh, vaccinated chicken farms in China. And of those, 637 of these farms had H9N2 circulating in them. And, uh, when we, she studied the uh, incidence of H9N2 in chicken farms in China, they steadily increased from 2010 to 2013. <coughs> and when we looked at the genomes, or the, the eight segments of the uh, influenza virus genomes over from 1994 through to 2013, uh, interesting thing happened. The, uh, the viruses became more and more homogeneous. And it's easiest to demonstrate that on the, the next slide. If we look at one of the genes, PB2, one of the important genes, uh, we see a lot of heterogeneity uh, back uh, in the early days of this virus. But as time passed, they became more and more homogeneous. And from 2009 onwards, they, they become very homogeneous with the passage of time. And essentially what's happened is that the, uh, using the uh, model from these guys, that these H9N2 went through a bottleneck and, and uh, selected a much fitter virus for transmitting to the chicken. <coughs> and then we divided these viruses, or the, my colleagues divided these viruses into genotypes defined by the phytogenetic analysis of the trees and the genotypes into um, 69 different genotypes in the viruses, uh, the H9N2 viruses in China. And then if you went back and looked at the genotypes that were prevalent in the different times from 1997, with the passage of time, in by 2010, they were becoming more homogeneous with genotype uh, G57 becoming more and more dominant until in 2013, almost the entire genomes were of G57 genotype. In addition to this kind of selection that's going on, the, these viruses are reassorting and, and picking up uh, G57 genomes by reassorting with quails and chickens and ducks. And so by 2007, the entire genome <coughs> is made up of G57 gene segments. So two things are going on. There's antigenic selection and reassortment are going on with these viruses. And the G57 is antigenically different from the vaccinating strain uh, that was being used. So the, the, uh, there was a lot of antigenic drift. <coughs> 
and we wanted to determine whether what was really happening in the chickens. Uh, and so, the, experimentally, the chickens were groups of chickens were vaccinated with the Chinese vaccine from 2008, and three weeks later, the uh, they were bled hemagglutination and efficient tests done and they were divided into chickens that had uh, rather lower HI titers and then very high titers. And then these chickens were challenged with the circulating viruses of the different genotypes. And then they were the, the isolation rate virus titers and shedding times were studied. This study was done by my colleagues in China, and it's a massive, a huge experiment that we couldn't have done in our laboratory. It's just a huge experiment. And, and so each experiment, these are groups of chickens uh, challenged with these different influenza viruses representing the genotypes over the passage of time with G57 in the middle here. Now let me just walk you through uh, what happened. Uh, when the, the vaccines were first <coughs> introduced, they really were composed of genotype 2. And uh, when tested in unvaccinated chickens, uh, the, the, there was no virus shedding uh, in the low or high. But then with the passage of time, uh, the, there was virus shedding that was not protected either by the high or low and so the vaccine started to become less and less effective with transmission uh, through to contact birds. The other thing that was happening is that this virus was becoming more transmitted through the respiratory than the intestinal tract. This virus was converting more and more from an intestinal virus to a respiratory transmitted virus. And this is really just a repetition of the same now looking at virus titers. And essentially the virus titers show the same uh, message that with the passage of time the uh, vaccines became less and less effective. Uh, and that the G57 viruses remain gave higher titers of the vaccinated chickens. And this was essentially saying the same thing. The only other piece of information is that now the virus is being shed for an expend, extended period of time in vaccinated chickens. So the the question was the, gen the genetic relationship of the G57 H9N2s to the H7N9. <coughs> and when we look at the genotypes, uh, the, the, each of the genes uh, that evolved by 2010 were prevalent in the H9N2s. The non-structural uh, was less convincing than the other genes. And, and the, the, the genesis of these viruses, in summary, what I've just been talking about, is that back in 2007, the, throughout most of China, there were viruses with a plethora of different genotypes <coughs> in the chicken. <coughs> And then from 2008 to 2009, there was some selection. Then they went through the bottleneck and G57 dominated in the, the whole of China. And this, this was the dominant uh, H9N2 virus uh, back in 2013. And at the same time, H7, the H7 gene came in from a wild duck through the domestic duck and then the Mondays came again through a different domestic duck. And so the H9N2 reassorted with these and generated this virus that is 
might be transmissible. Then moving on to the other H9N2 viruses that really worry me considerably is the H9N2 viruses in Bangladesh. <clears throat> and I think everyone knows where Bangladesh is. It's a small country uh, tucked in the uh, in beside India here. And, and unfortunately, Bangladesh is, is suffering terribly from the climate changes of the world and more and more it's going underwater. 80% um, of the people living uh, in Bangladesh have chickens in their backyards and 80% pro provide uh, virus uh, chickens to the market system uh, in the country. It's one of the poorest countries of the world and very overpopulated. And the, we, we have active programs going on in Bangladesh, in the huge, enormous poultry farms, uh, poultry markets, vast taking up a whole city block. Uh, and the, the process of the chickens occurs right on the ground outside the market. And the, 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 the markets are really not cleaned up at all. Uh, they just, uh, and so they, they, they're perfect breeding grounds for influenza. The quail, which is an insert, uh, are in a different market and they are maintained a little uh, in slightly better conditions. We've been doing surveillance in these uh, markets in Bangladesh for the last five years. Uh, <coughs> and this is just one of the most recent years. H9N2 is isolated from the poultry in the markets every month of the year. The virus is always there. Uh, H5N1 was introduced in 2007 into Bangladesh and it, it occurs usually in the cooler months of the year and disappears in the, um, in the uh, warmer months. But more recently, H5N1 seems to be present more and more. Most interestingly, is that there are many, many birds infected with both viruses. And I'll come to the significance of that. And very few other viruses. H4 was isolated, I think, for one month. Uh, but that's very rare. So the usual is uh, H9N2 with co-infection of H5N1 going on. And these H9N2 viruses in Bangladesh are different from what's going on in China. These viruses have evolved from the G1 plague of H9N2 that appeared in China in uh, 1994. These viruses mated with the highly pathogenic H7N3. This is one of the highly lethal viruses that is in chicken in Pakistan. And of the possible 256 reassortments, those that have appeared in Bangladesh in 2006, the dominant virus contained six internal genes from the hot strain with the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase from H9N2. And th this keeps changing. And the, the most recent one, the, there are three of the eight gene segments from H9N2 and three from H7N3. Uh, and so th this, this is a very, very different strain of H9N2. Uh, interestingly, the, the, again, this H9N2, even though it has a huge amount of genome from a highly pathogenic virus, is non-pathogenic in poultry. And there's only been one human case described. But when we analyze these H9N2s, this is an extremely busy slide, so, but uh, if, if we look at the eight gene segments of uh, the 
H9N2 viruses and then go out uh, and look at the amino acid changes that have occurred in the last five years. Whenever there's a red mark, it means that those are amino acids associated with transmission to mammals, including humans. And we see that these changes are occurring throughout the genome. These viruses are acquiring more and more and more amino acids that are associated with human transmissibility. So sort of stepping back, what, one of the things that we don't understand is how the G1 lineage got from Hong Kong uh, or southern China to uh, Dubai and the Middle East so early. By 1997, this virus was, the uh, G1 lineage was established in the Middle East, and it's still dominant in the Middle East. And so you, you could speculate that this was transmitted by migration of birds. I don't believe so, because when I was doing surveillance regularly in Hong Kong, we found that every day in, at this time, uh, whole shipments of passerine birds, the little songbirds, were going from southern China directly uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, at the same time, in Tokyo, they isolated H9N2 from these little birds. So we believe that the, virus, the H9N2 was probably taken by plane to the Middle East, and then its work got into, back into chickens, then came through Pakistan, into Bangladesh, and then H5N1 came in. Uh, as an aside, these, the, if we go back a little bit to this point. One of the things that we can't understand is that uh, many, many of the birds are infected with H9N2 and H5N1. And for some reason, these don't like each other. They just don't mate. They, they, they're, uh, they, they, they're just, uh, this virus that mates everywhere else, there, there is something that it doesn't like between these viruses. There have been a couple of descriptions of uh, a reassortment between the Pakistan H9N2 containing one gene. The PB1 is sometimes found, but it doesn't, it lasts for a, a week or so and is gone. So these are very interesting questions for, for the future. So this is a, a very old slide that was published in the South Morning China Post back in 1999 when we first described H9N2 in the markets. And it's one of those prophetic uh, cartoons uh, where H9N2 is the ghost in the background. And it really is still the ghost in the background <coughs> with generating the, the genes that uh, or the, the, the changes that allow both H5N1 to go to humans, H9, H7N9 to go to humans, and this H10 go to humans. What are the molecular changes in those viruses? That's for the young people in this room to decide. We just don't know what gives that H9N2 that unique ability to be the enabler. And so that's a very interesting question that's still out there, still unresolved. But it's H9N2 that's the real troublemaker in the world. And I repeat again, it's throughout every chicken house in Eurasia. <coughs> Turning briefly now to H5N1, the continuing global threat. H5N1 was stamped out of a majority of countries, uh, except in China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Egypt, Bangladesh, where those viruses are endemic. 
These are the countries that decided to use poultry vaccines. And unfortunately, the poultry vaccine uh, successfully reduced the number of human cases. And the poultry vaccine, all it does is to reduce the signs of disease in the poultry, but the, the chicken continues to poop out H5N1, drives genetic drift, it doesn't solve, solve the problem. And the, the recommendation of OIE, FAO, is poultry vaccination should only be used in conjunction with some other strategy of stamping out or other control methods, beginning with simply cleaning up the markets. So H5N1, one of our colleagues uh, just came back three days ago from Egypt, and in Egypt it's rather scary at the moment with what's going on with H5N1. H5N1 had disappeared from backyard poultry and from the main poultry houses by the use of vaccine. In the past two months, H5N1 is prevalent again in backyard poultry, it's prevalent again in the commercial uh, poultry, and the ducks in Egypt are dying. And when ducks are dying, humans start dying. And there have been 29 reported human cases and 11 deaths. And he tells me there are many, many more cases going on than are being reported. Uh, we don't know the molecular changes associated with this upsurgence in Egypt, uh, the, the, but the changes are certainly not in the hemagglutin gene. The, uh, and th this virus just recently spread to Libya and, and it's causing problems there. And the chances are it's going to become endemic in Libya. And of course, I, I can't talk about H5N1 uh, without mentioning the, the studies that uh, uh, Fushia, my trainee Kawoka and, and Chen reported. The question was, was really put out there by NIH and WHO, do, has, does H5N1 have the capacity to transmit in mouth? They did the experiments and now they're attacked for doing those experiments and they showed, yes, was, you could put three mutations into the hemagglutinin and using reassortment, you could get ferret to ferret transmission. I would like to uh, take Ron Fouchier out, and if he wasn't so big, I would boot him on the butt. Because in Malta, when he first described this, he described this virus as killing all of the ferrets. And that was simply because he injected the ferrets intricately uh, by injection, which is a very artificial way of doing it. The press picked that up and blew it out of all proportion. And so we now we're under restrictions uh, due to uh, dual use research of concern. And the ethics people have got their hands on it. And so now we are in deep trouble. And we are now actually in the United States, the most of the laboratories <coughs> are under an embargo of doing gain of function experiments. So we are blocked from doing experiments currently. And then briefly go on to the second bird flu that appeared in February 2013. And I, I have to compliment China. This is the first time that China shared that information immediately. They learned what, from what happened with SARS when they didn't share the information. I think the Minister of Health eventually might have lost his head over that, I suspect. <laughs> uh, anyway, they now share that information. Uh, and uh, they, they sent the sequence information to WHO and GISAID. And within a couple of weeks, uh, Novartis had already made a vaccine, synthesized the vaccine and had it prepared. So. Uh, the thing about H7N9 
it is low pathogenic in domestic poultry. And so in the poultry houses, we have no indication that the virus is there. It's a very benign infection in chickens. And in comparison, H5N1 in chickens kills every chicken. And if we compare the H5N1 with H7N9, the, the symptoms are extremely similar. Very, very scary disease. Fever, dyspnea, respiratory distress syndrome, and multi-organ failure. Uh, up to 60% of the humans in the case of H5N1 are lethal. 30% lethal to H7N9. Fortunately, neither of these viruses have yet acquired the ability to transmit consistently human to human. But we now know from the Kawoka work that it can be done. There were many uh, co-infections of H7N9, and they certainly come through the poultry virus. And so the, the first wave occurred in China early 2013. They closed the poultry markets rather late, and then the, the, the number of cases simply went to zero. Then they reopened the live bird markets, and with the uh, Chinese New Year, <coughs> again, there was a big peak of transmission. And what we're seeing at the moment in southern China is uh, H7N9 cases. The Chinese, next Chinese New Year is the 19th of February, uh, when the year of the sheep begins. Are we going to have another one of these? And so which one of these do we worry about? H5N1 took three years to uh, infect 100 people. H7N9, 57 days. Ferret transmissibility by respiratory droplet in cages separated. Uh, H5N1 doesn't transmit uh, unless you do the uh, Fuchsia trick. This one occasionally will transmit, some of the isolates have. And most concern is the replication in human bronchiopathelial cells, very low replication. This one replicates extremely well. And at the moment, in, in southern China, really H7N9 is not widespread. And what's worrying me greatly is that uh, even though it's not widespread, the, these human cases are appearing in Guangdong, in southern China, and in Hong Kong. And so it would appear that uh, this virus is acquiring the ability to transmit fairly well to humans. In addition to H5N1 in China, we've had five highly pathogenic viruses emerging in the past year. H5N1, H5N3, H5N8. This is the one we're going to, to watch. H5N6 and H5N2. <coughs> this H5N8 appeared first in South Korea at the beginning of 2014 and is spread across a great deal and <coughs> into Europe. Uh, it possesses the same hemagglutinin. It, it got its hemagglutinin from H5N1 and from the, uh, from the clades uh, 2.3.4.6. And the other genes are from yet another Eurasian avian lineage. Uh, I'm not quite sure on the, uh, <coughs> the uh, genome of the one that's just recently got to the United States. This virus is being spread efficiently by wild birds, as compared to H5N1. Uh, it appeared in uh, Washington State, H5N2 was in Canada, and uh, I read in this morning's pro bed that H5N8 was in wild ducks in California. So it's spreading rapidly. 
So what are the continuing issues? Poultry markets are the uh, main source of H7 in Uh Fortunately, neither the H5N1 nor the H7N9 transmit consistently to humans. But this H5N8 that I just talked about is spreading much more effectively by wild birds. Uh, and, and H5N1 continues to be a problem. I mentioned India, but it is a big problem in Egypt and now in India. And uh, migrating birds perpetu perpetuating these viruses. The dogma was, and I, I'm one of the people who uh, promoted it, is that these viruses, the, the wild birds transmit the viruses, but they are not being transmitted like the non-pathogenic viruses through the breeding cycle to the next generation. We don't know that yet, and we have to find out. Poultry markets, closing the poultry markets, eventually that has to go. I mean, the poultry markets are <coughs> the breeding site of these viruses. And this cartoon depicts what's going on at the moment. The Ministry of Health wants to close the poultry markets and close them uh, permanently. The Ministry of Ag says, I don't know, the farmers are giving us a bad time, we're putting so many people out of work, uh, we open them, so it's a case of uh, this fight between the, the, the health-related people and, and the uh, agricultural people <coughs> in uh, It eventually will, it will happen in China. But what about countries like Bangladesh that are dependent on poultry, and, and the, the uh, closing of those markets is going to take a much longer period of time. But eventually, they, the markets have to go. China is becoming more and more wealthy. They can all afford refrigerators. They don't have to get poultry on a daily basis. So in conclusion, we need to keep monitoring the H9N2 viruses. Uh, because those are the sweeteners that are causing the problem. Uh, poultry vaccination uh, contributed to the genesis of the H7N9. Uh, vaccination of poultry is really a two-edged sword, and in my opinion, it would be better if we didn't vaccinate poultry. Uh, closure of poultry markets would be desirable. And unfortunately, migratory birds are really spreading this virus. So, having said all those things, what are we going to do about these things for the future? The things that are currently going on in the uh, labs around the world are the universal influenza vaccine, there are residues in the stalk of the hemagglutinin that are common between all of the viruses, and this is being explored as the universal vaccine. Is there a downside? We've got to find out. The pig suggests that there may be a downside, so we've got to watch it. Uh, we could uh, run into difficulties with antibody, uh, <coughs> the dengue problem, hemorrhagic fever, which tends to show up in the pig with these universal vaccines are tested. I hope I'm wrong on that. Uh, influenza resistant animals, yeah, if, if you can manipulate the animal, you certainly can. We, we found that the, the reason why ducks in the world uh, are naturally resistant to all of those influenza viruses is because the duck has rig eye, the, the gene uh, inducing the interferon family. Uh, the, the, the duck has that family of genes. The chicken, the chicken during a uh, generation of the chicken, they lost the rig eye gene way back when. And so the suggestion is we could put the rig eye back into the chicken. And when we put the rig eye back into the chicken cells, the cells don't support. But if we put rig eye back into chickens, that will then probably cause a bigger problem. Then we'll have these viruses transmitted without disease. 
And so new antiviral is sort of no-brainer. We absolutely have to have new antivirals for influenza. We've essentially got one class, and it's only a matter of time before we get resistance to uh, the neuraminidase inhibitors. The third with the last H1N1s, it'll most certainly appear with these. And there are new antivirals in the pipeline like T705. Uh, and uh, we're working with Gary uh, Taylor in uh, Scotland on small peptides that inhibit the action of the cyanide. So, the people who did this work, I want to acknowledge uh, Juan Pu, uh, who spent a year from the uh, lab in China in our lab, and the people who did most of the analysis uh, from our own Department of Computational Biology. This is the, the, the group that uh, did the gen genomics of the human cancer patients. We put them to work on the H9N2, and, and so they produced the work I was talking about. And this young man, Kartik, did the studies on the Bangladesh viruses. And in conclusion, I just want to acknowledge the support from the National Institutes of Health and the many, many people in the world who contributed, my colleagues Richard Webby and all of the young people who did the work at St. Jude, uh, the computational biologist, Wan Pu and her boss, Jin Wai Lu from Fiji, and the collaborating labs in Bangladesh, Egypt, Canada, Hong Kong and through the WHO and the SEERS network uh, on influenza. And this is the Jewish Children's Research Hospital. It focuses mainly on cancer in kids. Uh, but years ago, I inserted an influenza group into that hospital. And uh, fortunately, so I thank you for your attention. Well, I, I get two, two, two questions. The first one, do you, do you believe there is few data coming out that shows that sometimes the microbiota, specifically the probiotic, may modulate the uh, uh, duration of uh, infection by viruses? Do you think that this may be an issue for poultry, for example? I, I, my hearing is lousy and I'm going to come over there. <laughs> do you, do you, there is a couple of papers that show that uh, so, so, so the time of uh, operating a virus after an infection can be modulated by the microbiota. Uh, do you think that there is a room for, specifically for poultry, to use probiotics that will modulate the excretion of uh, influenza viruses? I, I absolutely agree. It is a must do, so please do it. <laughs> please, please, please do it in humans as well. I mean, th there are some papers appearing, there may, might be some from you, where they're showing with swine influenza model uh, in, and the uh, microbiota uh, influence not only the disease, but the, the time of shedding. Yeah. So th this, this is, a, you know, the interplay, and you know better than me, the interplay between organisms is only in its infancy. Yeah. And, and, and it's so much to do. It's and such a, yeah, it's if a I was a young man, yeah. I would be yeah. in there. If I was a young girl. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I mean, yeah. There, there, there is one paper that just came out, uh, if you see that, that, that shows that the, the courage of uh, HPV in the vagina is dependent on the fact that you get lactobacillus versus atopobium. So if you get that lactobacillus, you clean that. And if mm. you get atopobium, you keep that. So it's. I think it's a very major issue. The so second thing is a question, I, I don't have any idea, but there was a controversy in the literature. Do you think that there are people in Vietnam or Thailand, for example, that have been infected asymptomatically by, by H5N1 because people claim that they get antibodies to this? Is that true or isn't it true? I believe it's true, mm -hmm. but they're not being detected. And, and it's uh, the... the, the uh, yeah, there's just, it just stands to reason that there are 
they, they were, you know, the prostitutes in Kenya with the eight, um, with HIV. Uh, yes, with HIV. Yeah. There's got to be uh, resistant people or those that oh, are oh, yeah. where, where the virus is replicating, causing no disease. Yeah, yeah. It, it most certainly will be there. But it's up in HIV. It's up in HIV. We just published that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, 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 it yeah. just stands to reason that uh, yeah. there's, a, there's a spectrum of sensitivity in the population and there's got to be a number of people that are not showing disease, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Xavier? Oh, I had a question about Arbido. You know Arbido, the antiviral uh, prepared by the, 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 the Russian people? The antiviral Arbido. 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 Yes, yes Arbido. We, we published. I, I had the girl from Russia in my lab with Arbido. Yeah. But I, you know, couldn't, I couldn't get Arbido to do a damn thing on any virus. <laughs> on the other hand, Arbido wasn't tested in combination. So if, if Arbido has uh, any activity tested in combination, we, that, 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 that may have some, but we couldn't show anything on its own. Okay, because the thing is that the Chinese use now tons of arbido in poultry. Arbido is being used in poultry? Yes, in China. <laughs> tons, tons of, of the product. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you know, uh, that's what happened with the, the, the uh, M2 blockers yep. by Mantadine. Yep. They, they were used in poultry, they were, and, and now there's total resistance to, okay. these, well, to those inhibitors. So, uh, yeah, oh, that, that's, I don't, that's not good use. <laughs> Anyone else? Other questions? Okay. Oh, thank you very much.